Uh, as we continue in our series of in Exodus, this is the last week, as Gerald has said, that we're actually looking uh, at a passage in the book of Exodus itself. Um, John next week is going to be looking at a New Testament passage which uh, references uh, back and explaining that to us. Uh, but as we look at this passage in Exodus 12, uh, beginning at verse 31, I'd like to start by asking a question really and, and getting us to think. Whenever we buy something, whether that's a product or a service, uh, there's probably three questions that we want to know. The first one is we want to know what we'll be getting. Uh, the second one, how much is it going to cost? And the third one is when we're going to get it by. Quality, cost and time. And uh, there is an old observation that uh, everyone wants to buy the best quality at the best price and have it in record time. But you'll only get one of those things and that'll be at the expense of the other two. Well, whether that's true or not, there are surely times when we go to buy something and uh, we don't get what was promised and uh, what was delivered wasn't what we were expecting. Uh, it was faulty or it cost too much or it took longer than we hoped. And you probably had your own experience of this buying stuff off the internet over the last few months. And Liz and I were only remembering uh, the other day of a time uh, where we must have been out and I think we had one of those little cards through the door, you know, the one where they say they've left it at your neighbor's house or by the back door. Well, this one had a single word, bin, written on. Well, it wasn't on the bin or next to the bin. It was in fact in the bin and it'd been dropped the full height of a wheelie bin uh, with the consequences that one can imagine. And so we don't always get what was promised. We don't get always get it in the way that we expected. Well, this passage we're looking at this morning sits firmly uh, in that framework of understanding uh, something uh, that was promised that we are now obtaining about fulfilling an agreement. Uh, God delivers what was promised. He delivers it on budget and on time. And this uh, shouldn't surprise us, of course, because God is, after all, God. He is the one who made and rules the universe, who has all the power and authority and is able to achieve everything he sets out to do. But perhaps the problem is more with us that we live in a different world, a world of slavery to our own desires, hating and being hated. And we experience constant disappointment. We live in a world of not getting what we hope for. And as a result, I don't think we're very trusting people. We're creatures of fear. We're perhaps like an animal that's known uh, mistreatment at the hand, hands of its former owners. And we're perhaps intensely suspicious of everyone who's, of anyone who's offering us something good. So when God agrees uh, to do this or that for our good, uh, we're perhaps afraid, we're perhaps unbelieving. Um, even though these things are absolutely certain. Well, this passage in Exodus gives a marker, it's a point in time uh, where the writer can highlight that God has done exactly what he said he would do. And so I'd first of all like to look at three main points this morning and then we'll look at a fourth uh, by way of conclusion. But these three points are that God delivers what was promised, God delivers on budget, and God delivers on time. First, firstly then, God delivers what was promised. If you perhaps remember in the Bible back in Genesis 15, God said to Abraham, the great ancestor of the Israelites, that your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I, says God, will punish the nation they serve as slaves and afterwards they will come out. And so this passage records that event, that coming out, the departure, the exodus from Egypt. And we've heard over the, these last few weeks of the judgments that God brought upon the Egyptians. And now we read that the Israelite slaves are released from their bondage. 
and a few chapters ago, the very last thing that Egypt's all powerful King Pharaoh is recorded as saying to Moses and Aaron was, get out of my sight. Make sure you don't appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. But the tables are very much turned and so devastating has been this last judgment, the one we looked at last week. This final plague that God has brought. Well, Pharaoh, he now begs to see Moses and Aaron. And as we read in verse 31, during the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go, worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds, as you have said, and also bless me. Well, it's a very pathetic response from a broken man. Pharaoh could not hold out against God forever. All the pride and arrogance melts away. And there he is, a broken man. And that's true for us too. Either we accept God's terms of peace or we will be utterly broken in our war against him. And so we read here that after all the tyranny and all the violence of these first few chapters, the Israelites finally get to leave Egypt. And I think it's true to say that because many of us have a fair amount of comfort and dignity and respect uh, throughout much of our lives, it's difficult to imagine what this event was truly like, what the true magnitude of it was. And for many, these experiences that we read of here, of slavery, of oppression, they are perhaps more academic. And we know about them because we've read about them or watched them on the news. But it would be quite another thing to experience them. We've seen in our own lifetime, uh, people being marginalised and persecuted. We've seen slavery, people being stripped of citizenship, rights, a dignity and hope. And we've watched genocide. And so in that sense, this story in Exodus of the Israelites is not remarkable. What you find in these first chapters is what one would expect, that the Israelite slaves, they're at the mercy of their oppressors. And there's some of them that are collaborating with their slave masters for an easy life. And some of them are offering at some level of resistance, but they haven't developed their own solidarity movement. There's no civil rights campaign and no armed struggle. These are people, it would seem, who are without hope in the world. What is remarkable in this book of Exodus is the miraculous nature of God's rescue, both how it came about and what it achieved. Here, in one morning, Israel got up and walked out of Egypt. The slaves got up and walked out of slavery. And I can't think of any event that has a parallel in our experience. They didn't flee. They were asked to leave. They weren't running away. This was a carefully planned and organised exit, a negotiated solution. And we have to think about the Egyptians. There was a massive financial cost to them at losing their slave labour force that would have had a massive impact on their economy. And there were political consequences as well. Uh, Pharaoh would have lost face. How is he going to keep control of everyone else if people can just get up and walk out of his country? Yet because of the plagues that they'd experienced and because of the judgments, we could say that the Egyptians were spooked. They were defeated and they were broken. And at the same time, we read of an incredible unity and togetherness as these Israelites walk out. They walk out like an army, 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. We can read that in verse 37. And it also talks about them walking out in an orderly manner by their divisions in verse 50, for instance. And this moment is foundational. It's the beginning of, at the beginning of Exodus, we read that everything the Israelites did involved the Egyptians. They were at the mercy of the Egyptian demands and the best that they could manage was a bit of defiance, a little bit of civil disobedience. But now in chapter 12, they're free and their lives are no longer gonna be dominated by this oppressive power. They're free to be the people they were always meant to be, a nation who will be the people of the one true and living God. 
in 12 chapters, an unimaginable radical change has taken place. And I can't think of any historical event which compares. But on a personal level, the Exodus story is not so remote from our own experience. The New Testament describes the church very much in, in similar terms. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And do we believe that about the church? Do we believe that in becoming a Christian, becoming a part of God's people, that a change more profound and more radical than the Exodus has occurred? Becoming a Christian is an Exodus moment. Here is a person who was a slave, a subject of Satan's kingdom, oppressed, yet unable and unwilling to seek freedom. Yet because of God's ability to deliver on what was promised, this person is enabled to walk out of slavery and to freedom, and that with great rejoicing in heaven. This world and our human condition traps us in a deeper and more profound slavery than the Egyptian experience here, the experience of the Israelites. This is a slavery which ultimately leads to hopelessness and despair. Yet the freedom that Jesus Christ brings is richer and better than we could imagine. It's not the freedom to do whatever we want with no reference to anyone else, because that wouldn't be freedom at all. But it's the freedom to be who we really are in loving relationship with our creator. So let's look at our second point this morning. And that is that God delivers on budget. God delivers on budget. Well, in one sense, the Exodus didn't cost the Israelites anything. It was all of God's undertaking. They didn't have anything to give for starters. And this deliverance comes free and it's all of God's grace. And our experience with God is the same. We don't have anything to give, no wealth, no good morals, no religious deeds. Yet God has said, come to him empty handed, acknowledging your need of his forgiveness and you will receive a life, a kingdom, an inheritance, a promised land. So in our own experience of grace and in this exodus, God delivers for free exactly what he said he would deliver for free. But there's perhaps another little bit of accounting that can go on because there is a credit note which we must be aware of. As well as the freedom that they get, there is provision. And God said in Genesis 15, referring back to that passage which I mentioned earlier, he said to Abraham that his descendants would come out with great possessions. They're not going to be leaving Egypt empty handed. And here in Exodus 12, uh, we have that promise fulfilled in verse 35. Uh, the Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people and they gave and gave them what they asked for and so they plundered the Egyptians. Well when someone comes to your door and ask you for your articles of silver and gold and clothing. I can't imagine that you would be that favorably disposed towards them. But here in this passage, such is the state of the mind of the Egyptians. They just want the Israelites to get out. Uh, for otherwise, they said, we will all die. Well, uh, they give up on all their precious things that they'd usually hold on to so dearly. And they're giving away those possessions just to rid themselves of the curse, to get rid of the Israelites from their land. God doesn't just end the captivity of the Israelites, but he makes provision for them. The stuff that they get here from the Egyptians, we could say is like reparations for their suffering. It's payment even for their slave labor. It's entirely fair and right. And God achieves this redistribution without need for further bloodshed. And to us, this plundering of the Egyptians may seem more like an add-on to the story, perhaps an extra detail for our information. But I think it's much more necessary to the ending of their slavery. Two recent examples, when Britain abolished slavery throughout most of its empire in 1833, it was the slave owners who were compensated for the loss of their labor force. 
not the slaves. And when America abolished slavery in 1865, at the end of its civil war, one black, one black leader noted there that many a freed slave after a lifetime of dependence lacked the means or training to set up on his own. He was free from the individual master, but the slave of society. He had neither money, property, nor friends. So when the British and the Americans ended their version of slavery, it was only ever a partial accomplishment. Yes, the slaves were free, but they still had nothing. They retained every disadvantage that they'd acquired. They were still starting from the bottom. They had no privilege, no inheritance, no network, no bank of mum and dad. But this is not how God is with his people. When they walked out of Egypt, they did so with a great sense of togetherness. They were becoming a nation, a society and a community. They walked out of Egypt with something with which to make a future. They walked out with their picnic for the day. They had their unleavened sandwiches and they walked out with their cash for tomorrow, their flocks and their herds. And they walked out with a healthy bank balance, long term assets, the gold and the silver that they gained from the Egyptians. God was making sure that they were adequately set up for life. And how about us? Do we see that God is freeing us from the slavery of sin and also sets us up for the Christian life? If flocks and herds and a healthy bank balance were what was needed for the Christian life, then that's surely what we would have. But it is not what is needed. What is needed, surely, is God's presence with us every day. The necessary equipment for spiritual warfare forgiveness for every wrong step that we take, a spiritual family in the church who will support us, and a hope that will sustain us to the very end, and a counsellor to guide us through life's pathway. When we walk out of the slavery to sin and into God's kingdom, we're not alone. We're part of the church and we're given resources for the life ahead. Thirdly then, uh, let's look at God delivers on time. God delivers on time. And referring again to uh, Genesis 15, God had said to Abraham, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own. In verse 40 of our chapter, we read the fulfillment of that promise. Now, the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years, to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left Egypt. Like many dates in the Old Testament, it's very difficult to work exactly, work out how, exactly how this 430 years is calculated, where it starts. Uh, but it's uh, entirely clear to us from the passages um, of Genesis and Exodus that the writer here, he sees this as the fulfillment of that expected time period. It's very much like the delivery note you receive in the parcel you have ordered, uh, telling you what it was that you've ordered, when it was ordered, and when it was due for delivery. Well, do you keep that piece of paper? I'm definitely not one for throwing things away, uh, but let me assure you, I don't keep the delivery note. And why wouldn't we keep it? Well, it's, it's because we have what was expected, a careful saving of the delivery note for all future generations to carefully pour over would seem entirely unnecessary missing the point even. The crucial point is that you've received the thing which was promised when you expected it. And the writer of Exodus assures us here that in his understanding, the Exodus happened on time. They went out of Egypt at the time when God promised it. And the New Testament assures us that in God's schedule, the promises of God are always delivered on time. And this is true of Jesus coming into the world and his work on the cross. When the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman. At just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And it's true as well of the coming end date of the universe in its present form. That too is going to be on time. God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And doubtless, these 400 or years or so, they appeared a very long time to the Israelites. Yet it did end at the appointed time. And in the fullness of time, they did leave. And doubtless, 
Those years before Jesus felt a very long time to those who are hoping for his coming. And yet he did come at the appointed time and his work was done. And now we can see it does feel a very long time before the second coming, before everything in the world is put right. But we shall enter that promised land and we shall share in Christ's resurrection and the renewal of all things at God's time. The Exodus serves to give us, give us confidence in God's timing, whether that's a long time or a short time. Finally, then, I want to just consider something else from this passage, uh, something else it raises, and that is the need for belonging. In verse uh, 38, uh, we read that many other people went up with them, that is, with the Israelites. And I believe in Becky's translation, it said about a, a mixed multitude going up. Well, here there are some people who are seizing an opportunity to get out of Egypt. And they're perhaps not themselves Israelites. They were perhaps other nationalities who had an equally bad experience of slavery in Egypt. Well, it's clear that there's, a, there's some degree of ethnic diversity to this group of people who are coming out. And these many other people were not Israelites, not ethnically and not spiritually. And the latter part of our chapter deals with this fact. And the Passover, as we were reminded last week, is the annual celebration of the Exodus. And there is a question here as to who can celebrate it. In verse 43, we read, no foreigner may eat it. Well, that's very clear. It's very exclusive. It's for Israelites only. These many people who've walked out of Egypt have found that it's possible to be caught up in the crowd and yet not truly belong. It's possible to come to church and yet not truly be a Christian. And here in this passage is for those caught up in Christian things, yet not truly believing and truly trusting Jesus. The burning question must be, of course, well, how do we get in? How do we belong? And in verse 48, we read the, the provision for this, that a foreigner residing among you who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover must have all the males in his house circumcised, then he may take part like one born in the land. The way in, the way to belong is the same, whether you were born into an Israelite family or you are a foreigner who wants to belong. It's not ultimately ethnicity, which is the key to belonging, but it is faith, which is the key. And through it being joined to the people of Israel, receiving their covenant sign circumcision well we might say thank goodness it's not that difficult to be a christian and join the church now we might however say that it is just as hard if only it was outward circumcision that was all that was required but the bible in both its old and new testaments makes clear that what was necessary uh, that was the true reality uh, would be inward it was the heart that needed to be circumcised we must part company with our pride and arrogance and thinking we're right and ultimately come and bow before Jesus and ask for his forgiveness and grace. Then we shall truly belong. We shall belong to Jesus and he shall belong to us and we shall belong to the people of God, that is the church. For the Christian, the reality of our faith is expressed in the sign of baptism. And this is the path of obedience we take to belong to the church. We must never be tempted to think of our membership of church as something like belonging to the football supporters club or the golf club or Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever sort of membership we might think of. Membership of the church, and I mean this in its universal sense, is much more like being an extended family. It is a sort of belonging. It is a community, a thing of permanence, of shared experience of feasting together, of supporting each other, of comforting, of challenging. It is in every way a shared life. And what is true of the church in its universal sense? It must be that which influences how we see church in a local sense. Trinity Baptist Church is a local expression of a bigger community of those who are journeying, who are following Christ from the slavery of self and sin and on the way to the promised land. 
If we travel with Trinity Baptist Church week by week, then we must answer this question. Do we truly belong? What if the answer to that question is no? No, we see ourselves as foreigners and outsiders to the message of the gospel. Then we know this, that we cannot truly belong until first we receive Christ in the way that he has taught us. That is by repentance and faith. If by faith we receive Christ, we will no longer be foreigners, but we will be like one born in the land, as it says in verse 48. Foreigners here could obtain the same right to eat the Passover as one who was an ethnic Israelite. And in the same way, through receiving Jesus Christ, we shall have citizenship of heaven and we shall truly belong. We shall be like one born in the land.